Amen. Second Corinthians 11. Um, after Paul talks about Satan and his apostles being transformed, I want us to look at the rest of this chapter, and I'm going to read it, and um, you'll see why I wanted to bring this up this morning. I don't want to skip over this. Because as I was thinking, as I was reading this and thinking about it last night, I was shaking my head going, that ain't me. That is not me. Uh, Paul says in verse 16, he says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little, that which I speak. And he's referring to verse 1 of this same chapter. Uh, would to God you could bear with me a little my folly and indeed bear with me. And what Paul is saying to them is no foolishness. Um, and he must have realized that this church that he's sending this to might consider this to be folly that he's teaching them. But he's teaching them something, in my opinion, 2 Corinthians 11 it really reveals the heart, the nature, the character of everything that we are opposed to. Because our enemy, our number one enemy is Satan. And Satan and all his devils and all of his teachers and preachers and false apostles, all of those people are against the gospel of grace through faith. They are against it. They hate it. They hate us for believing it. And this is the gospel that's free to everybody. It's the one that everybody can have, no matter how bad they are, no matter how poor they are, no matter, no matter how invalid they are, their inability to do certain things that gospel is available to them. And those who boast about what they do despise the gospel that's for the people who can't do. And that's the gospel. So that's what he's referring to back in 16. I say again, let them may think me a fool. If otherwise yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little. Now Paul's going to talk about himself. And in this case here... He's doing it as the example. Our typical idea of an elected official, a politician of some kind, someone who is the director of some government administration, a non-elected official, somebody who is in the hierarchy of the church, somebody who has a, a big name among everybody, for the most part, those people like to sit above everybody else. They want everybody to recognize that they're the boss. They're the one in charge. It's their way or no way. They should be bowed to. They should be respected. They should be given reverence. They should be, you should call them by their official title and whatnot. And Jesus hated all of that. And so... Paul now is going to tell about himself so that we and everybody else who read this understands that even though he is, without a doubt, the, the, the I'll say it this way, the apostle who wrote most of what we believe in the New Testament, Paul wrote it. God gave to him things and revelations that he didn't give to the other apostles. When Paul was saved, he did not confer with the other apostles. He did not go to them and learn from them. He got away from them and Jesus himself taught him the things that he pronounces in these letters. And so as that, the greatest, the greatest church planner, the greatest preacher, the greatest um, gospel preacher, the greatest theologian, in the world ever was the Apostle Paul. But notice how he talks about himself. He says in verse 17, That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this 
confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh. I will glory also, but he's going to glory differently than everybody else does. Preachers and the, um, the church leaders, they like to be set apart. Many of them, they want a robe that sets them apart. They want a collar that sets them apart. They want some sort of headdress that designates them that as they, oh, they're the holy man. Here comes the holy man. We must bow to the holy man. And Paul, his glory in the flesh is going to be different than what is typical in religion. So he says, verse 19, For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourself are wise. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage. Listen to this. Paul's saying, if a guy comes in and puts you in bondage, you'll allow that. And you'll bow to this man. If a man devour you, you'll allow that. If a man take of you, he said, you'll, you'll suffer them, you'll allow that. If a man exalt himself, you will allow that. You'll suffer it. If a man smite you on the face, you allow that. There is a, there's a video on YouTube. I've seen it and it made me mad. A preacher, a pastor, who is just systematically going person by person in that church, abusing them publicly and telling them that they, they have no other right other than to hear this from him publicly. And he's, it's, it's like he's the exalted holy man of God. And what I think about you, I'm going to say it in front of everybody and you have to listen to it or you're not saved. And to me, that is nothing more than abuse. If I think something about somebody, you know, Joe comes in chewing turkey, I'm teasing him. I don't care if he's got a mouthful of turkey. I'm jealous, okay? <laughs> but what I think about Joe, if I've got negative feelings or things about Joe, according to the scripture, I'm not supposed to expose him to the whole church and lay him out in front of everybody and make him glad that I did it. I either let it go or I tell God, or God may say, go to him. And we go, we go to each other privately, and I sit down privately, and I deal with it privately. And if he says, you know what? It's a problem I have. Will you pray with me? Yes. And it stops right there. It doesn't go any further. But you see this kind of abuse. And Paul's saying that. He said, the man smite you on the face. You'll allow him to do it. You'll take these people in who will exalt themselves over you, who will put themselves up on a pedestal. You'll put them on a pedestal. They'll demand that you give them everything that you've got. Make you a promise that God will repay you back double. When the truth is, you've just given over everything you got to a man who will give nothing back to you. And this is the kind of stuff that people put up with all the time. So we look in verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So everywhere they boast, Paul says, guess what? I am too. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And he's right in that. Nobody ministered Christ more than the Apostle Paul did. In labors, more abundant. I mean, Paul, God gifted Paul with the ability to not have to be married to a woman. So Paul then was able to spend every moment furthering the gospel, advancing the doctrines, teaching people, working with people, counseling. He didn't have to take care of his wife too. 
He didn't, didn't need it. He spent every moment, even, even him taking care of his own pay by making tents. That was his trade. So he makes tents so that nobody else has to pay his salary so they can't say, Paul's just doing this for the money. He won't take it. He will not take anybody else's money. He'll make tents so that he is reliant upon himself. And even at that, he's going to be ministering the gospel somehow, some way. So he spends every waking moment. Doesn't go on vacation. Doesn't it? He is just dedicated as much or more than anybody to the cause of Christ. And he says, I am more in labor is more abundant. And then this. In stripes above measure. What does that mean? That he paints stripes? Like on the highway? He got whooped. A lot. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. American jails are nothing compared to prisons around the world and compared to the type of prison that Paul was in. No prisoner rights, no prisoner advocates, no, um, what's that group um, that advocates around the world for prisoner rights? Amnesty International, no Amnesty International, nobody to complain to if he's got maggots on his food, okay, nothing. In prisons, more frequent, in deaths, oft. He should have been dead often. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So he got 39 stripes, five times. How many is that? 45, 40 times 5 would be 200 minus 5 would be 195 stripes that he received. For what? Because he didn't pay his parking ticket? Was he selling drugs? Was he uh, pirating music? Was he selling children? Nope. He's preaching the gospel. And it was the Jews that administered the stripes, and we know that because they're the ones who always did it 40 minus the one. They did it, they did that. Here's what I heard, I'm not positive, but here's what I heard, that their tradition was, God said give them 40 stripes, but in case someone miscounted, let's give them 39 so that we don't break the law and give them 41 accidentally. That's what I heard. I'm not positive, but that's what I heard. But anyway, Paul gets 39 stripes five different times. And he takes it. He doesn't go against it. He takes it. He takes it from his own people. Um, thrice, verse 25, was I beaten with rods. Once... Was I stoned? They tried to kill him by pelting him with large stones and thought he was dead. That's why they stopped. They thought he was dead. This is the same man who held the coats for the people who stoned Stephen. And as he is receiving these stones... I promise you his mind is back with him holding those coats. That's where my mind would be. I'm the one who held the coats while they stoned an innocent man. That, I think that affected Paul. I think God used that always in his life to let him know that even though his sins were forgiven, and that sin was forgiven. Paul's thinking, I deserve every one of them. Deserve every one of them. So thrice I suffered shipwreck. 
I would only have to suffer that once and then you would never get me on another boat. A night and a day have I been in the deep. We hear that story is in the book of Acts where he floated. After their ship wrecked, he floated for a whole night and a whole day until they landed on that island. And then he gets on the island and they're building a fire. And as he's grabbing, I mean, here's the chief apostle, right? Everybody should be serving him. He's the holy bishop. No, he's out gathering sticks and he's got a bundle of sticks and he's getting ready to throw it into the fire and a snake was in that bundle and latches on his hand. He's got a snake on his hand. And he shook the beast in the fire and everybody's around going, you're dead. We're not cutting it and sucking that out for you. You're dead. And they watched because Jesus made a promise that if that happened, the poison would not kill him. And nothing happened. No swelling, no sores, nothing. So, um, verse 26, in journeyings often. I mean, I, I don't mind traveling, but I like my comfort. Okay, that's why Sweetie Pie and I bought a trailer so we can have our own bed wherever we go. And it's a very comfortable bed. We like it. But in journeyings often, sleeping wherever he can sleep, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. That's a lot of perils. It's a lot of things to be, to be afraid of. And I'm afraid of every single one of them. In weariness and painfulness. That I know. And when I am in pain, it fatigues me to no end. And I do not want to stand up here and preach to everybody. In watchings, often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings, often. So he's got afflicted hunger where he can't find anything to eat. And then he's got self-inflicted hunger where he has food to eat, but he refuses to eat it because he's praying about things. In fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. When Paul established a church, then he would establish a bishop for that church and then he would leave. But that didn't mean that Paul was done with that church. I mean, he's been to the Corinthian. He set up and built the church at Corinth. And now we know from Scripture that Paul has written them a total of four letters. They are always on his mind, night and day. And he prays for them, and he worries about them. And he fasts for them. Paul, Paul prays probably for them more than they pray for themselves. He cares more about how that church ends up than that church even cares. Um, and he, so, so every church that he preached at, every one that he established, every place that he's been, when he leaves, he takes them with him. And they are everywhere that he goes. So even when he's not being beat up by the devil or the devil's people, he's still worried about those churches. When does he take a vacation? When does he remove himself so that he's not thinking about them anymore or thinking about the next sermon he's going to preach or whatever. When does he do that? I don't see here that he did. He spent everything that he had in this life for Jesus Christ and nobody else. So he said, verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not. If I must needs glory, 
I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmity. So now, if you take that verse and you go back to verse 18, you see it now, you see what he's talking about. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. But Paul's glorying is not in how exalted he is and how comfortable a life he has because he's the big chief holy man and they carry him about, they drive him about, uh, he takes whatever people give to him, he doesn't have to lift a finger, he has people to do everything for him. That's not Paul. That's all the other religious people, but it's not Paul. And so, I looked at this, and then I compared me to this. There's no comparison. I take, I sit, and I have other people do things instead of me doing it. I'm not this guy. I don't know what's coming in my future. And I guess that's probably a good thing. Because if I knew that any of this was in my future, I'm not positive I would want to hang around for it. I'm not saying I would quit. I'm just saying I'm not positive I would want to wait around for it. I would want to say... God, how about you get me out of here before any of this happens? So here's the man that if we're going to have a religious leader, this is the kind you would want. One that he would do for you more than he would allow you to do for him. That's the kind. That's the kind that I would say... I need to be more like this man. He's the example that I would like to end up being more like him. To take the beatings. To take the unjust punishment. To take the hunger. The fastings. The weakness, people hating me, to be able to take that and use it to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of religious leader that I want to be, that I know in most cases, in most areas, I'm not that person. But I, I want to be. So if I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Can't lie to people. Can't tell them that I'm something that I'm not. Can't boast about things that I'm not. Can't lie about something God said. I can't say, well, I think God is this way, while the Bible says, no, God is this way. So I have to also not lie to people. And there's a, that's a double-edged sword. On one aspect, I need to tell people the truth. But there's a part of me that doesn't want them to be offended by that. So that, that makes me not want to tell them the truth. But I'm required to tell the truth. Whether people get offended or not. If I do it in love and do it the right way, if they get offended, they're getting offended at the truth and not necessarily that I said it. So, verse 32, in Damascus... The governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of, Damas of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. This guy sent an entire garrison of troops to surround the city, waiting for Paul to sneak out. What were they going to do? Probably kill him. Okay? And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall 
and escaped his hands. Paul, there was your opportunity to get killed and go to heaven and not get beat up no more. Paul didn't take that one. He took, I'll sneak out and get away from him, knowing that eventually somebody else was going to catch up to him and beat him up. How many beatings would you take if you knew you didn't deserve it? How many railings from somebody, how many accusations from somebody would you take knowing you didn't deserve it? How many times would you risk being arrested for none other than speaking the gospel? How many times would you risk that? How many churches in countries all over the world don't say things because the government says you can't say that? Okay? Why? Because they don't want to risk getting in trouble. But part of the job is if God tells us to say certain things, then we have to say those things whether or not we could lose everything. And you have to, I want you to understand this. See this nice church building? This is home. This is, this is what I like. This is the place that I want to spend the rest of my life. I don't want to be anywhere else. And I don't want anybody to take it away. But, if at some point, our beloved government passes a law, an anti-hate crimes, an anti-thought crimes law, and we violate that because we preach what the Bible says that people are doing is wrong. And they say that's a hate crime. We're not going to throw you in prison, but we're going to seize all your bank accounts and your property. We just lost our church. We just lost everything. Cameras, internet, everything gone. Because we said what God told us to say. Okay? It's a possibility. Again, I'm glad God's not telling us that this is what's going to happen. So God, don't tell us. Okay? But if it's meant to happen, it's going to happen. Okay? What would you be willing to lose to save your soul? What would you be willing to lose? We're Americans. We don't want to lose anything. We fight for our independence, right? But God may have a different way. Um, in the book of Revelation, they cut Christians' heads off because of the word of their testimony and Jesus Christ. That's what they believed in. And they stood with the word of God and, they, and that was their testimony and they're not going to be anything else. And the Bible says they loved not their lives even to the death. And I think the devil knows in each one of us what it is that we would hang on to the most. And he'll use that against us to get us to turn away from what God offers eternal life we hang on to things in this earth and the devil knows that and he will use that against every single one of us if it's your money if it's your house if it's your family if it's your status if it is your physical health the devil will use everything within his power to get you to turn away from Jesus Christ don't think that he won't Everything is up for grabs. And if God did it and allowed it to happen to the most righteous man in the world, Job, who are you? Who are you? Do you not deserve to lose everything, including your freedom, including your health, including all your money and your possessions and your status? Do you not deserve that? Yes, you did not get what you deserve to get when God gave you His grace. 
You didn't get it. So I had to, I had to go through this today to remind us all what's at stake. Everything is. And God, don't put it past him. Don't think that you're better than anybody in the Bible who had to suffer, who lost, who, had, who was killed, who was imprisoned for just saying the truth. Jeremiah was, Paul was, uh, Peter was. They took Peter and John and told them, don't you dare preach Jesus anymore. And they beat them up. And when Peter and John walked out of there, they did not say, we're going to get us a lawyer. We're going to put a stop to this right now. That's not what they said. They counted it joyful that they were counted worthy to be beaten for Jesus Christ. They were not about retribution. Although they said, you tell us not to, but if God tells us to, we're going to. Disobedience in that case, is warranted because they commanded them to do something against what God had already commanded them to do. And so anyway, you have to think about what you're willing to let go of, what you're willing to lose, what you're willing to suffer through. I don't like suffering. I don't like it as much as anybody else. And I do a portion of it in my body, in my mind and my emotions, I do a little suffering. But it's not anywhere near what I'm reading here. And so the whole point, you know, we've been going through First Peter. The whole point of First Peter, uh, turn to uh, chapter 4, First Peter. We'll get out of here in a second. First Peter chapter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Notice that he said arm yourself. He didn't say guns. He didn't say AK-47s, SKSs, automatic, semi-automatic. He did not say that. He said arm yourself with this mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. So, go back over this, maybe later today, as you're telling God thank you, this is Thanksgiving, as you're telling God thank you for what He's blessed you with, you look at Paul's life, you have not come anywhere close to that. Tell God thank you. And then, if you have to deal with any of these things on this list, tell God thank you. Because that's where Paul gloried in, was his sufferings, not his comfort. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good word. We thank you, Lord, for the example that you give us. God, I do not know the future. I do not know what lies ahead for me. And the things that you're going to take away from me. And the things that I'm going to suffer. The things that I'm going to lose. I don't want to know it. But I do want to know, Father. That if I lost everything. I'm not going to turn my back on you. Because if I lose it here. I cannot even conceive what I will gain in heavenly Jerusalem. So, Father, arm us with that mind that suffering is part of the game. And then, Father, help us to be strong because we know that we're not. Lord, I believe that if you have destined any one of us for even a portion of that life, you will be the one that will sustain us through it. That's what I believe. So, Father, we don't even have to ask you to bless us in that situation because we know that you already will. But, Lord, we do ask you to bless us. And bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen.